This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Ledger and the Ledger Nano S. Half peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more. And by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we'll talk to Richard Crabe, who is the founder of Numerai. Numerai is a new kind of hedge fund built by a network of data scientists that is using blockchains and cryptocurrency in an especially interesting way. So uh, let's get started. Great to have you on the show, Richard. Thank you. Good to be here. Tell us a bit about your background. How did you come to be involved? How did you end up doing what you're doing right now? Well, I um, I originally um, was uh, I was always interested in math and finance, and uh, I started working as a quant after I graduated with a degree in math, and um, machine learning was just taking off at the time. And so I started to uh, work on these data sets that, uh, you know, they were using quant at this asset management firm I worked for, but they didn't use machine learning. And so I was got to basically create mach- their first machine learning algorithms and make a whole fund that was based on machine learning. Um, around the same time, I was also reading about what was happening in blockchain encryption. And I was, you know, invest in the, in the Ethereum crowd sale and the Augur crowd sale. And I was sort of c- kind of keeping an eye on that as well. But mainly my focus was, uh, was on machine learning. And um, they ended up building this fund that uh, worked very well, but um, we couldn't really uh, collaborate with anyone because the way finance is set up is like structurally, uh, everything is secret and no one's working together. And so I had this data set that was proprietary that I couldn't share with anyone. Um, and I started to have people I knew who were better than me at machine learning, but I couldn't collaborate with them. And so that's where I started to think about the idea for a hedge fund that had a public open data set that anyone could model. And uh, so that's where I started to have the idea for Numerai. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you arrive at it from that, uh, or from that position that you were in it's sort of almost an obvious idea or right like you think like okay it should go in that direction right that would be better if it did but when you first had this idea how did did you think it was possible that you how did you think this was going to turn out it was uh it was a feeling of knowing that um everything made sense uh and i'd really thought through it because i'd been working on this data set for so long um, the big challenge was how do you frame a data set, a financial time series data set into a machine learning problem that's actually quite fun. And um, a lot of the competitions, machine learning competitions on Kaggle, um, they had uh, every time there was a finance one, it was actually it was actually uh, bad. Uh, it ends up being very easy to cheat or uh, overfit. Um, and time series is somehow not really the, the right kind of uh, thing for machine learning. And there's very low signal in, in these data sets. So thinking about all that was the hard hard part. And, uh, and the next step was to actually be able to share it without giving away the data. And so that's where I started, to re- I started reading about hom- homomorphic encryption and how we could use that um, to basically share the data while preserving all predictive structure but having it be that none of none of the people who are looking at the data had any idea what they were modeling. And that was the big uh, insight, um, because if you give people raw data, they end up uh, cheating or overfitting uh, or really they don't. Most machine learning people don't want to learn about finance either. So they would make a model that wouldn't be wouldn't make sense. But by framing it in this very specific way, um, we can get models that that actually help the help the hedge fund. Cool. Well, I mean, we're going to speak a lot more in detail about how exactly this works, but just to give some introduction for people who aren't as familiar with hedge fund and 
fund trading? When when you were managing this fund, was this at a hedge fund as well, or was this an asset management company? So can you can you give some in, uh, overview of this industry? Yeah, it was at an asset management firm. They uh, they have a number of different fund products. They had about managing about fifteen billion dollars, um, but a lot of it was long only, and so that means that you only buy the stocks. You don't go short. Um, but when you have a really, really good quant model, the most profitable way to run it is in a long short uh, style, because then you get the alpha or the uh, returns on your longs and your shorts and and are hedged against market risk and other risks. So um, when I you know, when I did build this, it was to create a long a long only product to beat the all country world index, which is like the S&P of the of the world. Um, and uh, it, it worked really well, um, and, but it was really much more suited for a hedge fund strategy. So that's why I quit my job, moved to San Francisco and started uh, Numerai. Um, and I think there are definitely lots of hedge funds out there using statistics and mathematical models, but I don't think there are that many using machine learning kind of at their core. Um, so even just having a great machine learning hedge fund would have been a good idea, but I, but I think um, the crowdsourcing and the uh, c collecting intelligence from all around the world would, took it to another level. And, and, and in general, what kind of big trends are happening in the hedge fund industry? How is that industry changing? Well, they definitely have quant investing on the rise. Um, I think it's... I think it's close to one trillion dollars or something in quant, and it was like five hundred billion a few years ago. Um, so it's definitely moving out of human fund management into quant fund management. But it sounds a little bit cooler than it is quant. Um, it's really a lot of it is still people, um, but they've just made some mathematical model. Um, so it's automated, but it actually isn't really artificial intelligence. Um, so I think what's going on in inside of uh, DeepMind and Google in terms of AI is, you know, way ahead of where hedge funds are at uh, with it. Um, and a lot of them are, are really doing things that they've, they've been doing for many, many years, um, certain kinds of statistical arbitrage strategies. And so a lot of them are actually extremely correlated. So when they go down, they, they all go down together even though they're all hedged, even though they all claim to uh, be uncorrelated. Um, so it's a, it's a strange thing where you have um, the shift from fundamental into quant, but now quant itself is crowded. And, um, and that's why uh, new hedge fund innovations, uh, I think it's a really good time for it. Um, and there's certain hedge funds that are doing things in cryptocurrency and AI. And I think right now that it's not clear, you know, who's going to uh, uh, be, be the leaders in this next wave of hedge fund. But I think it is clear that there is a new wave and that um, that traditional quant can't really last the way it has. So uh, let's let's go into what uh, Numerai does. But before that, uh, I think in, in many of our discussions, we are coming across this word, which is a data model, right? So can you explain um, what a data model is? Can you give us an example of a data model and how a quant fund would use a data model? Yeah, well, um, you're just looking for a pattern. So one of the easiest ways to think about machine learning uh, in terms of modeling a data set is just imagine you have a scatter plot and there's just a whole bunch of points in 2D uh, you can fit a line to that uh, data. Uh, and um, maybe it's like uh, corn growing over time or something like that. And you could say after six weeks, how far would it have grown uh, based on some historical data? And um, you can just use a simple linear model to predict that. And, and then you've used data, created a model, and now you can predict corn growth. Um, now, taking that into other domains, it gets more complicated because you have many, many different variables. So I think on Numerai right now, we have 20, 21 features. Um, so that's like a 21 dimensional scatter plot. 
And you're not really just trying to fit a line, you're trying to fit like a very complicated curve in 21 dimensions. Um, and so that's the kind of principle of it. And what you're looking for is patterns and uh, finding the best best model that's possible on that data set uh, based on the patterns in it. But as you can see, like nothing I've described needed any domain knowledge. So you don't need to know what the axes are in order to fit a line. And uh, you don't need to know what numerized data is in order to, to make a great model on it. Um, so <clears throat> that's that's what uh, what modeling is all about. And um, you can go from, it's gone from being very simple, uh, having just a, a linear model to very, very, very complicated uh, with the things you can do with uh, deep learning and TensorFlow neural nets. So applied applied to like financial trading, could could you give us like a toy example? Let, 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 so you're, you're talking about these 21 dimensions. Could you give us a toy example of like maybe something like something that is like three dimensions or something and um, is a relevant example to the financial industry? Well, um, you could uh, a lot of people. Uh, there's two two big quant factors. Uh, one is momentum. One is value. So how cheap is a stock on like a P.E. basis? And momentum is how well has it been doing lately in terms of the price? Um, and so just fitting a model to those two features, um, you can say, if a stock has good momentum, does it go up? If a stock has good va value, does it go up? And if you take lots of different stocks over long periods, you might find a pattern that actually says, yeah, if uh, momentum is high and value is low, uh, it's a good time to buy. And, uh, and the stock, uh, stocks that have those properties will tend to, tend to go up. Um, and that's what you can learn from a data set. So I downloaded this, this data set before and I had a look at it because I was just, you know, kind of curious. And, and, and yes, as you pointed out, right, there was, uh, you know, you have this thing of, of an ID, right, which is some number. And then you have all these features, like 21 features, and then you have this thing called target. So, so it would target be the price uh, of, a, of a stock or is that a way to think about it? It's more, yeah, it's more complicated and um, we don't really talk about the data. That's why we, we, uh, we encrypt it and the way we do, but um, it is, it is, it is worth thinking about it like that, um, that the, a, a one is like a up and then like a zero is down. So if you have a target of one, that means the stock is, is good a target of zero. It's bad in some abstract way. Um, typically, you don't really just want to make money. Uh, you want to actually, have, you know, also hedge out risks. So um, we put a lot of things into the data that actually make the models uh, very nervous about taking risk. And so you take away all the patterns that uh, that are too obvious um, and actually risky. But so it's not like because you know for me I, I would think okay so you want to make money in the market right and you're gonna say okay this Apple shares right so let's say that would be uh, a variable and then you, you're gonna take uh, all these things maybe i don't know consumer price index uh, gdp growth f f uh, exchange rates or uh, all kinds of stuff and you, you try to understand okay what kind of dynamics are there that affect uh this share of apples and then you know you give this data and then people figure out even though they don't exactly know actually what they're modeling is that a uh, wrong uh, is that how it works or, or is that different that's pretty much uh, pretty much right we we do um we do global equity uh it's a global equity long short hedge fund so we're actually not too interested in where is the market going to go, be next month we have no idea and we don't need to know um we care about where individual stocks will be. Um, and we also don't really care about where interest rates will be or where um, GDP will be. So all those things are kind of like macro uh, variables. And we are really looking for idiosyncratic stock uh, risk uh, that we should take. So um, mispricings in stocks. And uh, it turns out you don't need, you don't need to know, you know everything 
uh, about the macro economy to, to find mispriced things in the market. So some people may be aware, uh, which is, is always, you know, you sometimes see it on Reddit and so different places where you have this technical analysis, you know, people do these sort of charts and lines and, you know, as I, I studied economics in college, so this always looks extremely ridiculous to me, <laughs> uh, but, but I don't know, maybe it's not. So is, is a lot of the data coming from that kind of thing too, that you say, okay, you're actually going to just look at this price feed, right? Over time and then try to figure out things like momentum, right? Because something like momentum, you would see purely based on the changes in the price of that asset itself. Yeah. Um, you, we're definitely not doing like technical analysis, uh, like, like, like the pictures you see. They, but obviously, there, it, like momentum is a, in a sense a technical indicator in that it is a it is a uh, based on price, um, based on total return. So um, that's a that's a variable based on price. Uh, things like PE, um, it's more about you know whether the stock is cheap for its price versus just uh, to do with its price. Um, Generally, on shorter time horizons, you can have technical analysis style things um, like relative strength index and things like that. They actually they actually work on, on short time horizons, um, but we actually hold things for a very long time. So we don't really look at uh, look at that. Um, but certainly, yeah, that there's I don't think uh, the chart chart theory has um, has much uh, credibility anymore. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the best hardware key security solution on the planet. But Ledger is more than just a hardware wallet. It's your path to eternal bliss and happiness and peacefulness. Do I look like I'm losing sleep? I am, but it's not because I'm worried about my cryptocurrency, my Bitcoin or my Ether, and that's because I use a Ledger. Ledger devices support multiple cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash and more and you can even secure your ERC Ethereum tokens with them or you can add the security support from Ledger to some of the wallets you already love and use like Electrum, Copay, My Ether Wallet and others. All your keys and segregated accounts are derived from one unique seed. Seeds are generated on the device and are never exposed to the host computer. So when you make a transaction, your ledger will present you with the details and kindly ask you for your confirmation before signing. How polite is that? So the best choice right now for anyone looking to invest in security is the Ledger Nano S. It's a keychain sized device that fits in your pocket. It has a screen and buttons and connects to your computer or Android phone using USB. Look, if you're holding crypto and you're storing your keys on your computer, on your phone, or worse, an exchange, you know that's a disaster waiting to happen. Don't be the person that loses their keys because they were careless with them. So don't wait any longer. Secure your Bitcoin, secure your Zcash, secure your Ether. Go to ledgerwallet.com and get your Ledger Nano S today. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter. Can you explain what, why, why are these data sets so valuable for hedge funds why is there such a you know keeping the data private well it is just like it's sort of the core so um if we gave it gave it out um for us uh, our users could just go and start their own hedge fund uh with our data taking everything we've bought and learned and uh and then just running away um so we wanted to make a system for for us in particular where you would actually have no incentive to to do that, and uh, actually have more of incentives to work together, um, and to to build value together. Um, but generally, um, the data sets are very expensive, and um, so hedge funds don't want to part with them. And then um, they also have uh, there are lots of um, different kinds of data sets too. So there's some hedge funds that talk about buying satellite images to look at uh, park the parking lot, uh, see how many cars are at Walmart. So there's all these different weird, weird data sets. And some of those are very expensive because it's like the hedge funds have to have to pay for the satellites and stuff. So um, it, it gets kind of crazy, but basically you can't give up your edge. And that's why you, it's so secretive. But in the tech community and in other industries, actually, you can both benefit. Um, and finance is just so, so competitive 
that uh, you can't you can't have a situation where you, you're helping each other. And so the best hedge fund managers, they can be friends for 30 years and they have no idea what each other other's hedge funds do. It's kind of weird. So it seems to be that the key here is to have private data, but to enable collaborations, like computations, collaborative computations on that private data without disclosing what that data itself is. Yeah. Right? So what uh, what kind of technology does Numera use for this purpose? Well, yeah. So this is the the key thing. Um, wh when you give away a data set, one thing you could do is anonymize it, right? So you could just say, okay, well, this stock is Apple. I'm just going to call it um, ID number seven. This stock is Google. I'm going to call it ID number eight. And so you take away all the names in, uh, of the stocks. Um, but that actually isn't, isn't enough because the patterns uh, inside that data are still so strong. Like everybody will know, oh, I know Apple's PE is 10.7 because I can, I can, I can cross-reference it with uh, Yahoo Finance. And um, so you can have kind of weird things um, where uh, people can use do comparative attacks to basically figure out your anonymization scheme. Um, so you really want to go much further than, than that and into encryption. Um, uh, and so I started looking at what's called fully homomorphic encryption. And it's this really cool futuristic thing. Uh, when it was invented, it was about a billion times too slow. And then uh, a couple years later, it was like a million times too slow. And it actually hasn't got much better than that. So it's this very, very slow thing. And what it does, it takes one megabyte of data and turns it into 16 gigabytes of data. And that, so that's a huge uh, weight. Plus, it also um, makes it much harder to work with, with machine learning. So what we ended up doing was figuring out ways to, to do it uh, differently. And um, uh, we're using something right now called neural cryptography in our encryption. So our VP of engineering, this guy called Jeff Bradway from DeepMind, and uh, he, he came up with this way of uh, encrypting the data that was uh, using two neural nets. So it's really interesting. You have one, one that's saying, um, uh, like, take this data, find, uh, find some features in it that preserve the signal of the data. And then you have another net that's saying, OK, I'm going to try to, I'm the adversarial network. I'm going to try to decrypt what you just did. Um, and then you make them kind of fight with each other. And uh, the one is saying, I've preserved the signal. And the other one is saying, I can't decrypt it anymore. Then, uh, then you know you have something that uh, that neural net can't, uh, can't uh, decipher what it is. Um, so we do things like that to make sure that we have all the signal preserved, but also it's very difficult to kind of invert the transformation that we made. Um, and so far, you know, we hadn't had anyone say what the data is or reveal, uh, reveal it. So most of them don't really care about it. They would just want to solve the problem. Uh, they don't really mind. They don't really care what problem they're solving. Um, but that is kind of a critical technology that we've had to develop. And I think we're pretty, you know, have done some really interesting things. I don't think there's any company in the world, um, with the problem that we have, which is like we want to work with everyone, but we have we don't want anyone to know anything, and um, it's an interesting uh, creates an interesting dynamic. I I just wanted to uh, sort of add one point here because I guess even if people decrypt the data, okay, they would have the data, right? So that would be you know a certain loss, but they wouldn't really be able to replicate what you guys are doing, right? Because you also get uh the predictions from all these different people and presumably those aren't public so so you are the only one that can then combine all those is, is that correct yeah exactly um and that's that is an important point we are not trying we're not looking for um the best model and then we're just going to shut the whole thing down and, and hire that guy give him a job at numerai um they're re we're really looking for lots of different uncorrelated models built on our data um so what would happen actually if someone were to decrypt it and say they were going to go start their own fund with their model, 
sure, we would lose them, but our combined model will we'd be way better than his. Um, so it's like, even if you're the best user and you, and you quit Numerai, the, the remaining users are still better than you when you put them together. Um, and that's, uh, that's, this principle is called ensemble theory. Um, and it's kind of a big part of machine learning. It's like, if you have lots of little models, um, that are different, then you can actually make a, make a much better model, um, than any one model. So with these, with these models, there's like, there's a way by which you source these models, which is like through your crowd mechanism. And then you also need a way once you have sourced these models to combine these models. So let's first talk about how, 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 how do you decide how to combine these models? Is the, are the combinations also sourced from the crowd or that's totally in house? Yeah, that's, that's where we stop. Uh, we, we have to, <laughs> people have asked us, why don't we let the crowd, you know, combine the crowd models. And then it's like, well, who's going to combine that? But, um, so we stopped there and, uh, and we, that's the kind of one model we make is the model that, that, uh, is the meta model that combines all of them. Um, we first have a few different measures. Uh, one thing we don't want to do is pay, is pay you for giving us something we already have. So if you submit a linear model, we can, we can run a linear model ourselves, believe me. Uh, and, but we'll pay you, but if, if you, if someone else submits a linear model, then he doesn't get uh, anything because we, he's very correlated with something that we already have. So, um, on Numerai, we're really trying to look for original models. And so if you pass this test called originality, then, uh, then, uh, you kind of, you can kind of earn, earn Bitcoin. Um, and, and if you don't pass, then you kind of don't own anything. And the other one is, uh, concordance, which is like, it's sort of to do with how much we think your model is kind of like shifty, uh, like, cause there's lots of different ways that users might try to game the system. And so we have another check for that. Um, and then we, we have, we rank them all based on logarithmic loss, which is like a machine learning metric. Um, and after that we have basically about 300 or 400 really good models that pass all these tests. Um, and then we do a layer of machine learning on top of that. So we say, okay, um, let's, let's try to combine these. And, uh, you can take a simple average that does very well, and you can go even further, um, and do machine learning. And then that does even better. Um, so that's, that's basically how we do it. And so the other part of your, of your, of your company is the sourcing of these models, right? So, so explain to us how, how you source these models currently. Well, all we do is, um, I just made this website and uh, put put a data set up uh, in 2015, and just people came. Uh, it's it's it was a very interesting uh, problem. It's very difficult to do well. It's extremely hard to do well on the data set. Uh, there's never been a, a data science tournament on encrypted data. There's never been a hedge fund that was actually going to trade the predictions. Um, we also paid in Bitcoin, um, and we also one of the key things is we don't actually get the user's models. Um, all they do is send us predictions. So it's like we're licensing predictions from their models, not actually taking their models. Um, so they're submitting a bunch of predictions to us. Um, and that means that we don't know what their model is either. So they have no idea what the data is. We have no idea what their model is. Um, and, and that, that is a sort of, it kind of, yeah, makes it symmetric in a way. Uh, users could say, you're not paying me enough. I'm not going to do this anymore. And we'll, we'll have to, uh, they'd have a position, a bargaining position. Uh, and that's why I, I think a lot of the blockchain community likes Numerai. It's like this sort of trust, trustless part of it where we don't trust you with our data, uh, but you, you, they don't trust us with their models. But so if, if you don't have the models themselves, how, how are you able to combine these models and apply machine learning on their on their combinations because like you can't you can't you can't generate infinite like you can't play the model on different data sets indefinitely or, or can you yeah what we do is we make them submit on a big holdout set 
I think it's like 100,000 rows. Um, and they're submitting probabilities on all of those. So having it be um, on this big holdout set, having it be like that they're submitting predictions uh, for this over this very long period, we can actually train the model on on like almost like on their back test. So um, so it's almost like they're giving us probabilities uh, that we can model without actually giving us their model. So but that's the importantly that means we can only get new um, new insights every time we do a new competition. So right now we do a new machine learning competition every week. And that's to get updates from our users. It's actually to get get probability updates on uh, what they think uh, is going to happen. Cool. Uh, yeah, this is super super crazy. So, so that means the the they go like a year in the future, or can you say anything about like how long? Because because you run it every week, but presumably the predictions that people give are actually beyond that time horizon. Yeah, we end up holding. Uh, things for six to nine months, um, which is quite long in, in quant space. Um, and so, but, but we do like getting weekly updates on, okay, well, maybe we should rebalance uh, or sell uh, things if, if suddenly the, all, the, all the numerai data scientists think we should. And, and why do you hold them so long? Um, I think it's hard to compete in the shortest time horizon. Um, and uh, there are very few people doing uh, machine learning uh, on longer time horizons. I think there's basically lots of mathematical modeling happening in these short time horizons, one week, uh, one minute or less. Um, but going further, it's actually, it's actually harder to do. And so fewer people do it. Uh, it's harder to do from a machine learning standpoint, but it's actually easier to implement. So to start a new hedge fund that do, does high frequency trading and uh, it would cost you like a hundred million dollars just to get set up. Um, but if you can do longer term predictions, then you don't have as many trades. You don't have to worry too much about execution. You actually don't even have to worry about being ripped off because um, you're going to hold long enough to cover those costs of, of being ripped off in the by high frequency traders. So uh, it's like a sort of a special uh, time horizon, I think, uh, for AI. And also, you know, sort of philosophically, morally, maybe you, you want uh, to be actually investing, right? You don't want to be um, just just finding, uh, picking up nickels uh, in the market. You want to actually be holding stocks that you like and uh, don't want to have an AI that's just like, fighting to compete in short short time horizon you can actually have an ai that's like a real investor that's like making decisions about buying stocks that actually people would want to hold that that's very interesting how you sort of you know uh almost make this moral judgment and emotions about these like predictions that the ai is gonna create well, it's not a judgment. <laughs> uh, the high frequency <laughs> people are doing, uh, doing, doing something good for the market. Um, but I do think it's, it's over overdone and uh, you never want to be doing the thing that's kind of already happened. Uh, so if there's a book about it, you don't want to be doing it. There's no good, no good book about blockchain. So you probably still want to be doing it. Cool. So, so, so tell us about, tell us how this tournament works. So let's say, this week, right? So, so you, you run a weekly tournament and I'm somebody who builds a data model. Can I use my model, that, that same model week after week after week and keep earning payouts? Yeah, do, you can. Do I need actually. to develop something new? Yeah, you can actually, because the training set uh, remains the same week to week. Um, we're just asking you to predict on the latest live data, basically. So because the training set stays the same, um, you can actually set up a server, uh, can it automatically send predictions as soon as new numerai data uh, c comes comes about. Um, and so some people have actually done that. And so it's not actually them uh, spending hours and hours working on it. They've just put a server up and, and, and we're pinging that server effectively. So so basically, like you're, you're asking all of these different models. So let's imagine there's like the 100 data scientists having 
hundred different models and here model is basically like a function right there's some incoming data and there's a function and it's going to compute an output and that output is a prediction of some form on how a certain segment of the stock market is, is, is going to move right and so you have so for example I have a model here I'm giving you a prediction about how a certain part of the stock market is going to move and there's somebody else around the world that's doing that and there's hundreds of us basically you're pinging all of our servers and getting all of these predictions and then you have some method of like combining these predictions and converting them into actionable trades on on your side exactly yeah so how does your tournament identify uh, so let's say like 10,000 people submitted models and in the end you maybe want only 100 that are that are unique so how do you kind of incentivize people to um, what to give give new models how, how are they exactly paid for it and how like for example my question is like so i make a model that's unique and somebody else makes a model that that's unique for a different part of the stock market how is the magnitude of how much i make versus how much he or she makes determined it's based on um based on your life performance. So what we do is if you submit a model, uh, we don't give you any, any, no matter how good it is, we don't give you any money until uh, a month later when we can see how well it worked on live data. Um, and uh, a month is a decent amount of time uh, to, to, see, to see whether the model is behaving the way we thought it would. Um, and so everyone is ranked uh, uh, based on their logarithmic loss, uh, which is just like how many times you were right, effectively. Um, and so what we do is uh, we rank them based on that and then pay them based on like a schedule. So um, the person who's coming first uh, makes about um, $500 and the second $400. Um, and that goes on all the way down. Um, but what, so that's, and, but we pay those, we've paid those dollars in Bitcoin. Um, but the other piece that's new is this, is our own cryptocurrency, Numerare, where actually people are earning hundreds of times more money based on that than they are from, from, uh, dollars. So, uh, that's the key, uh, innovation i think as well where it's like people wondered how you're not you're not paying these people enough they could just go work uh somewhere else and i think a lot of people weren't doing it for money they were doing it because it was interesting um but now um by having our own cryptocurrency uh it's it's like we we can actually afford to pay them uh a lot of money and the top users are making a lot of money right now so tell us how this cryptocurrency works the key thing that the smart contract can do, so it's an Ethereum ERC-20 token. Uh, it's called Numerare. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's live. It's, it came out about uh, two weeks ago. Um, and what you can do with it is, you know, we're always trying to figure out which models are good. Uh, that's our big thing. If we can tell which models are good, we can make a better meta model and we can make more, more money in the hedge fund. Um, so... The uh, one way you know a model is good is if someone's willing to back back it with their own money. And so actually, when I was um, at my old job, I was like, we have to do this machine learning fund. I, I, I promise it's going gonna, it's gonna to work really well. And I actually, and they said, okay, well, put your own money in, into it. And so I put money in with the firm's money and, uh, and my boss's money. And we all put money in because we, we, were, we were prepared to uh, stake uh, our our money on it and so by having that you actually work much harder because you like you have a lot to lose um, you don't just you say okay well let's see what happens I'll give you five models and one of them will work and we'll just see what happens um, you have to really commit and say well this is the one I want to put my own money on and so that dynamic uh, we weren't capturing at Numerai before Numerare because no one had anything to lose um, so <clears throat> we created this cryptocurrency we gave up about one million t to our users, and um, we said, "Okay, you can use this uh, to stake your models, which means a little bit like taking a side bet that your model is going to work." And um, 
So by doing that, you're expressing your confidence as to how, how much um, uh, you think uh, the model is going to work. And uh, if you're right, we actually pay you dollars. So if you stake Numeraire, you earn dollars. And so because of that dynamic, that uh, the Numeraire uh, is connected to the payouts, uh, if, you, if you bet a lot and you have a good model, you'll get this payout. Um, that actually gives Numeraire value as well. And uh, I think that's also what, uh, what's, uh, so, so it's sort of like necessarily people value it above zero because it's, it's a way to actually claim dollars in, this, in the payouts. Um, so, and, and, it, and it has worked extremely well. I mean, we've seen the stake models um, be, be very, uh, you know, much better than the than the regular models because because people are are staking on them. So it's like this final piece that we needed. And um, in a regular hedge fund, they have the situation where all the, all the employees have money in the fund, and and we didn't couldn't really capture that with our user base. And that's why we started to think about blockchain and ways you could do that where everyone actually is in it together and. Uh, uh, has a lot to a lot to gain and a lot to lose if Numerai wins. So, so just to kind of clarify how Numerai works, does that mean you you created? Uh, have all the Numerai been created, or are new ones being created continuously, or how does that work? Yeah, there will be twenty one million max. Uh, that's the cap, and uh, it'll get there. Um, I think in four or five years. Um, so every week we mint new ones and it's in the contract. So we can never change, we can never change it. Um, and right now we've, we've, uh, haven't minted. Yeah. We only gave away about a million to our users. So there's still plenty more to be, to be won as time goes on. Yeah. The, the idea though is as well is, um, if your model does well and you staked it, you win money, right? But if your model does badly, we actually destroy your numeraire, uh, provably on the blockchain. It's not like we're taking it for ourselves or something. Uh, we just destroy it. And um, so these dynamics of the minting of, of new coins plus the sort of destruction of old coins um, and also the coins going tending to be held by the better data scientists over time, uh, I think it's going to play out in a very interesting way where the people who it becomes more and more valuable to people uh, to have it and to hold it. So, so does that mean, um, because if, if I don't have Numeraire, I can still participate, right? And if my model is really good, I can still get some money, dollars and Numeraire, or do I yeah. only get Numeraire in that case? You get dollars and Numeraire before the main tournament. You can just do, anyone can do that. And then the staking tournament, you risk Numeraire to win dollars. Okay. Okay. And, and so let's say I'm, I'm putting in, uh, I'm, I'm risking $10,000 worth of numeraire that, that means I can then earn double my money or how is that kind of mechanic? It's actually in a kind of complicated multi-unit Dutch auction me mechanism. Um, but it really is, uh, the whole the kind of outcome of it is that, um, the more you stake, the more you stand to win of the payouts. And also, um, because of the way the auction set up, there's a sort of property of self revelation, which means, um, you, it's rational to, to bid the true, the true, the true amount. Um, so people are, uh, participating, um, and we can, because of the auction mechanism, we can actually say, oh, given that you did that. And given that you're rational, um, we can say, oh, okay, we know what you're, we know what you've got. We know you have a very, very good model. We know that you believe your model is going to work with 90% uh, accuracy. So that's a very interesting um, part of this. Uh, and uh, the idea that they, you know, pr the, the, the bet, the stake uh, is actually communicating information to us. Let me understand if I uh, get this correctly. So let's say in the future, uh, two years or three years, and you know, this has become a big thing. 
So do you think that most of the money being paid out is actually going to be paid out through these uh, side bets? And so that if somebody comes in and they say, I, I have really good models, right? I, I know I'm, I'm doing really well here. Uh, I, so I'm going to go and buy Numerare and sort of bet it on my model. Uh, and then I can make much more money. And that this is kind of how the demand for Numerare would be driven. Is, is that how you see it play out? Yeah, exactly. Um, and we've seen, we're seeing things like this now. Like there's a, there's a, a sort of hedge fund, crypto hedge fund. Uh, well, just a fund, I guess, um, that bought a bunch of Numerare in our Slack from from our users, um, like OTC trades before it even existed. Um, and I was like, why are they doing this? So they're just speculating on the price. And it was actually that they, they wanted to um, use it in the staking competition. They wanted to basically hire data scientists to work with them. Uh, and they would be like kind of lending them Numerare for them to stake um, if they didn't have enough, but they had a good model. And they, so it's very interesting to see these kinds of things. And I've I heard other people say since the launch of Numerare, they've quit their jobs and now they can actually do Numerai full time. Um, and they're working with, you know, maybe speculators who have a bunch who can't use it because it's kind of useless to them because uh, they can't stake um, and then they work together uh, and uh, swap it and buy it. And so it's very, it's very interesting to see. And I think it's, yeah, it's only the beginning. I mean, we've just been going for two weeks and you have these outcomes already. It's amazing. And I guess what, what sort of uh, is interesting here, right? Because you guys are switching to paying out in, in Ether. So, you know, I could, and, and since Numerare is an ERC20 token, you know, you could even imagine that somebody creates some smart contract there where, you know, people can put in Numerare there and maybe that somehow gets lent at an interest rate to people submitting models. Like, do, do you see that kind of application being built here? Yeah. Um, that is, uh, yeah, also a recent announcement. We're not going to use Bitcoin anymore, we'll just pay everything in Ether. Um, and it really does allow for, it's big, it sounds sort of silly, but it's a much bigger change than you would think because we can actually do the payouts uh, kind of on chain uh, in the same same place as, uh, as where the numerary stakes are happening. Um, so you could have, uh, you could be a speculator I could say I don't have any numerare, but you have a thousand. Um, let's make a let's make a deal. Uh, if my model works, we'll share the profits. You'll say, well, I have no idea uh, whether you're going to honor that contract because numerai is paying you. Uh, and uh, how do how do I know you're going to share it with me? And you can say, no, I'll build a smart contract, and the smart contract is actually the entity that is. Uh, playing on Numerai and the smart contract automatically, whenever it wins money, it automatically shares it between you. Um, and so that concept of making um, DAOs that are connected to Numerai, which is connected to the real stock market, is uh, extremely uh, compelling. Um, and I, I do like that I, there's a lot of innovation in blockchain, a lot of uh, things like Prism and things, but a lot of them are on on the blockchain, um, and I think it's pretty cool to have like this one company that's actually connected to the stock market, but like pulling out all the wealth from the real world into crypto. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is.
So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. Can you can you use your data model to trade cryptocurrencies themselves rather than stocks? We could, but uh, there's not as much data in crypto. So we have for stocks, we have data going back 30 years. Um, but for for crypto, it's not as much. And uh, there are also fewer cryptos. So it's hard to uh, hard, harder to decide. Uh, well, you always want more data. So you have 10,000 stocks per month for 30 years, but with crypto, there's like 50 cryptos that you could trade. Uh, and they only go back to like one year. So, um, it's not really quite right yet. I think it would be great if all the stocks in the world were on the blockchain. Um, then we would, then we'd really be, uh, be in a, a, a huge advantage. Um, but uh, I'm not sure when that's going to happen, but I'm sure it will. Why would stocks being on the blockchain be an advantage to you? The hedge fund industry is like very structured for, for the bigger hedge funds. So it's not really like structured in a very fair way. Um, like the biggest hedge funds who need them, who need them, who need it the least get these huge discounts from like the prime brokers like UBS and Goldman Sachs and um, and and so it's just very difficult to even start trading and you need lots of capital. So I think if it were to be on the blockchain, it'd be much more uh, open and like everything would be visible and uh, you would actually have a much more fair market. I mean, speaking about that, to me, it, it feels it feels like there's kind of a piece of a decentralization and crowdsourcing missing here, right? Which is you, you crowdsource the, the data, you know, basically decisions on the trades. But then on the other side, when it comes to the money that you're actually investing, you know, you're structured as a traditional hedge fund. So I think your, uh, you know, investors are uh, institutional investors, or I guess the kind of people that would invest in hedge funds uh, currently. So do you also see that happening that you say, okay, you're going to uh, kind of crowdsource the pool of capital? Yeah, we are a, a proper U.S. Uh, hedge fund. Um, and there are rules around uh, accredited investor status. So you need to be an accredited investor to invest in a hedge fund. Um, and you also need to, yeah. Uh, and, and, so, and then there are also very high minimums. So it's really not worth our while to manage less this less than a 50,000 from someone I mean, it, it, we'd be making a, a few hundred dollars per year from that person so you want to have these much bigger check sizes um and a hedge fund can really only be profitable at like 300 million uh aum so you really want to talk to institutions not individuals um that being said Right now, it looks like you can get three hundred million dollars in a crowd sale uh, if you if you if you have good branding or something. But uh, I I just think it's probably the wrong yeah probably the wrong thing for us uh, uh, at the moment and, and will be for a long time because I don't think the regulators really want individuals to be invested in hedge funds. It's a little bit like they're protecting protecting investors from uh, risks that they don't understand. Yeah, although I guess we are also starting to see uh, now with CoinList uh, a first sort of ICO platform that's uh, limited to accredited investors, you know, so uh, maybe we'll see that kind of crowd sale too. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. That's, uh, that, I like what they've done there and that, that could be a way, a way in the future where you could actually raise money. So you did this fantastic interview with uh, uh, Chase and Kalakanis on, on This Week in Startup. So we'll, we'll definitely link to that in the show notes. But one of the things you said in there was kind of you know, striking to me. Uh, and I was like, that, that's a crazy statement. But you said in the long run, you see Numerai invest, uh, managing all the money in the world. Can you explain like, what you mean with that? Yeah, this uh, this that statement I actually I made that to a journalist in um, a few months after starting Numerai. So I hadn't even like really hadn't barely started. So and I just said that I want to manage all the money in the world. And I don't remember saying it, but then it ends up sticking. Uh, and um, it is true though. Uh, I do think that's what we that's the goal here. 
Um, I don't think, okay, think about how many people are working in finance. Um, some in the best universities, about half of American, the best universities go, go to, uh, go to finance. And, and they're basically uh, playing a zero sum game. Um, and uh, with each other, and we are not having nearly as much uh, investment in basic science and technology and stuff as we used to, um, because all these people have gone to Wall Street, and that would be fine if they were all working on something, but they're basically working on the same thing, and just in different offices, uh, competing with each other, so where it's like, so that's a really big problem. If never I can make it be possible for those people to do other things, um, and uh, and actually a system like Numerai could do that. Um, there's many things in the world that have been automated. Like think about the phone switching. Like pe there used to be people switching the phones uh, to to make calls, connect calls, and now that happens automatically. Um, and I think we could have something like that. Like if you're a public company, there's this thing called Numerai. It'll give you. It'll tell you what the price is. Um, and, uh, and it give you liquidity and it'll just be like this thing. Um, and, and you don't really need many hedge funds in a world where you have an open hedge fund. And, uh, I, I think Numerai is the most likely candidate, uh, for, for this, where we can leverage blockchain and AI to actually, uh, be the last hedge fund. And, um, and I, and so yeah, I think that other hedge funds, um, it will be very difficult to compete. Even the best, the biggest hedge fund right now has about 150 PhDs working at it. Uh, that's the biggest one. And uh, we have 20,000 uh, data scientists on Numerai now. So that's already like, you know, a lot more. Um, and it'll be hard. I mean, we'll definitely have 100,000 in a year. So it's just like, I don't really see how it will work um, for the for other date for other hedge funds to compete with us. Your answers were, were were really great, but with this one, my feeling is if imagine there were only there was only one hedge fund in the world, right, and like it was managing all the money of the world. By definition, its returns would be the same as the returns of the market. It couldn't beat the market if it were managing all the money in the world. So. I, I just I just intu intuitively feel that the bigger a hedge fund gets, the lower the margin by which it beats the market until it gets to such a big size that it becomes the market. And do you really think that in the hedge fund industry they can any day be the single hedge fund that wins it all? Because why do you why do you need to beat the market if you have all the money in the world? It's like, but then, if I'm if, I, if if I'm not if I'm not beating the market, can I just not own index funds? Why do I need a hedge fund? It is, but I mean, this sort of happened to you know happening to Warren Buffett and uh, and, and other hedge funds. He, you know, he's got so much money; it's very difficult for him to return anything different than the S and P five hundred return. Um, but I I think it's it won't yeah it won't really be framed in this way. I guess think about like Bitcoin. Um, that's how I like Bitcoin is a sort of like a way to do money transfer. It's like a bank, uh, sort of like a sort of bank, but it's like got this weird crypto feel. Um, and you can keep money there, and you can transfer money. And I think that's what we're trying to do is is actually not really make um, another bank, but make like the bit or like another hedge fund, but make like the Bitcoin of hedge funds, where it's like this protocol thing. And it's not really, it doesn't really play by the rules. Um, and uh, it actually is a, is a sort of utility for the world that no one really owns uh, unless they own the, the cryptocurrency or something. Um, so I think that's kind of where things are going, that like this idea of making a protocol, something open, um, I, I can see, yeah, I can see something like that working this century. I mean, I can also see, I can see that claim, okay, we're going to, or, or that aspiration, we're going to manage all the money in the world. I, I can see that direction being possible. If you change something fundamental about uh, how Numerai works, which would be, you'd have to open up so that other people, other funds, 
uh, could go there with their own pools of capital and their own data sets uh, and basically, you know, have the same data scientists, the same community run the thing, right? Because, you know, you're a US hedge fund, right? Well, but there will be other ones, first of all, in other markets that, you know, they can't put money into a US legal entity, right? So you'll have that factor. And of course, the other factor is also going to be, uh, you know, we've already talked about how data sets are this proprietary thing. You know, some people are going to have these satellite data, so other people are going to have all kinds of other data. So it, it also makes sense there that, you know, there will be competitive differences in, in the type of data you have, and, and that's not going to go away, right? So it w would be make sense if those people also can, can have use Numerai plug in there, uh, you know, maybe they'll pay some kind of fees via Numerai or, you know, somehow uh, drive the value of the platform uh, but can compete in some way too, and maybe even compete then uh, in terms of uh, as a as a data scientist. Maybe I, I will be able to choose. Okay, you know this fund pays me better than that fund, so that's where I'm gonna um, try to do the best model for. Yeah, I definitely see that. Um, I think first there is one thing you said there, which is. Uh, what if you have you have your own data set and you want to bring it to Numerai? Like we don't have any way for you to be able to use your own data set or even your own analysis. So you have to use our encrypted data. Um, and that's the only way we, we do it. But I do think they could, and we have been thinking about things around, what if we allowed people to submit data sets or, you know, and, um, and I have been thinking about that, but we don't have anything to comment about that yet. But the, on the other hand, you know, letting other funds be on the Numerai platform, um, it would be great for them to give us their data. Uh, but I don't think you, you kind of get a lot of benefits from having the, it be one fund. Um, and I think what would mo most likely happen is we have very, very low fees because um, we can charge way lower fees than any other hedge fund because uh, just the way we do things, uh, we have everyone outside uh, the company. We only pay the people who are good, not the people who are bad. Um, so I think we could have extremely low fees in our hedge fund. And actually <clears throat> that will be an incentive to have uh, other hedge funds give us their money or other their LPs switch, uh, switch from that fund to ours if they don't. Um, and I think the fee, the fee in uh, how we could have lower fees would actually be a very big uh, innovation too, uh, and uh, I, I'm optimistic that, and, and and you know the hedge fund industry is very efficient. Once something starts working, people really go for it, and so it can actually happen very quickly. You have a hedge fund with managing five million dollars in the second year, they're managing half a billion in the third year, five billion. So it's kind of amazing how quickly it can it can scale, and. Um, so by if we can have higher returns because we have more talent and and uh, and uh, lower fees, it'll be a really good hedge fund product. So uh, what's one thing that's really interesting about Numerai is uh, this is one of the first startups slash projects that is I think successfully merging the blockchains and the AI slash neural network space, right? Like these two, these two technology area seems seem to be like silos they're like experts in this area and experts in that area very rarely do you get uh, get a mixture of it uh, is is the particular technology you're building applicable to other kinds of uh, data fitting problems like computer vision or something like that the machine learning we're using no not the particular machine learning you're using but like this way of building uh, a data model like so essentially you are coming up with this function right like your company is this like this building this giant mathematical function that takes all of this data as input and gives out predictions right now I see like a, a lot of a lot of problems in like neural networks and artificial intelligence are like that right like it's given all of this let's say visual data what's a function that can result in the identification of objects inside that particular particular piece of data so is your general approach of like crowdsourcing data models and combining them in order to have a meta model 
and that meta model like predicting things is it applica- is it applicable just to this particular financial field of like stock trading or stock investing or can it be really scaled across different kinds of uh, other kinds of problems yeah some people have said uh, what about um healthcare data because um it's interesting you don't want to actually share healthcare data because it's sensitive so n- numerize seems like the perfect thing you can have uh, you can encrypt the healthcare data let people model it and uh and then find the best model i actually think um numerai might be one of the only applications for crowdsourcing machine learning um i don't actually think the healthcare one would work uh or it really any other one and the big reason for this is um the in the stock market a very small edge uh really matters but in other industries it's actually many other kinds of frictions that matter so for example there are already brilliant um neural nets for diagnostics so you can have a neural net diagnose uh, lung cancer or whatever based on an x-ray better than a human um but it's really uh regulation and um and uh and just general you need the doctors to believe it you need the patients to believe it you need some new laws you need all these different things and actually you don't what what you don't need is just a 1% improvement like that's actually not very it's not going to move the dial on the friction so i think many other industries have these frictions and um finance it doesn't you can actually no one can stop you from trading if you find find an edge it's it's kind of amazing to me when i was a kid i you see how how come i can buy stock in a company without asking their permission like how can you buy apple stock without asking tim cooks permission and it is this amazing thing you you it's it's public you it's, it's your it's uh it's totally totally up to you uh what what you buy and um and every other industry doesn't really have that so you can't uh it's always quite a lot of churn and uh to to get to get to move move things forward but the stock market is kind of like instant so we're almost at the end of our episode but i'd be curious what what's on the road map uh, what's coming up for numerai in the next uh, you know two years and then where where do you see uh, the project in uh, like let's say two or three years from now how what stage is it going to be at we were working a lot on numerair and it was you know we had to get it audit smart contracts uh, audited and things like that and um and now it's just very interesting to see what people are doing with it and how much it's uh traded and and uh staked and it's 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 amazing um but i do want to build out that part i think that's the key thing is like how do we have um a whole ecosystem and that's kind of plugged into this to the numerair smart contracts and uh staking models and and just generally develop it and i lo- i love this idea that people would actually speculators would actually team up with with data scientists i had no idea that would happen when i was coming up with it so um and and then definitely user growth is uh, something we've never focused on um it just happens um but i i do think we we could do we could do more we could also do more data i think we our data set um you know there are new there are new data sets coming that we haven't announced yeah i mean if we do if we do have uh good returns in our fund over the next year uh, like that will be really a huge um kind of proof of everything working you know, because we will have had the numerair out and lots of data uh and we did, only recently did this neural cryptography thing only recently did the numerair so proving these things are working uh is going to be very important um and then the, the question is how ca- like can we manage a lot of money and a lot of like you were saying earlier it's actually difficult to manage more money as as it goes up so um figuring out models that haven't ever been invented and that can do huge capacity um is something we have to do and and take uh take billions of dollars and, and can you share anything about uh, the return so far is it working you know you're beating 
the stock market or hedge fund averages? Um, we actually can't talk about the returns or the AUM um, because of regulations. And so we, you know, we're not trying to pitch, uh, when we do a podcast like this, it's to, you know, get people to learn about the company, not, not to pitch the hedge fund. Well, Richard, thanks so much for coming on. That was super fascinating learning about uh, Numerai. It's an incredibly interesting project. Uh, I think it's probably uh, the first of many that we're going to see at this intersection of blockchain and AI. And it's just uh, incredible, the surprising, strange things that are uh, coming out of this. So yeah, so thanks so much for coming on. And of course, uh, thanks for listener for once again uh, tuning in. It was uh, great being here this week. So we'll be back uh, with another episode next week. And of course, we are part of the List of Bitcoin Network. So you can find this show and other shows on listofbitcoin.com. And if you want to support the show, the best thing you can do is you can leave us an iTunes review, which helps new listeners find the show. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.